Your hometown news leader presents No Holes Barred. He's a very aggressive driver. A guy that was hard charger, wide open all the time. Curtis Turner, hard charging legend. Welcome to Charlotte, North Carolina, everybody. I'm Travis Wells. Outside the NASCAR Hall of Fame, the hall will grow by five members. It's a strong class. That includes Jerry Cook, Bobby Isaac, Bruton Smith, Terry Labonte, and Curtis Turner. Curtis has plenty of ties to Southwest Virginia, Floyd and Roanoke to be exact. We thought we'd start the night by taking a look back at just who Curtis Turner really was. Curtis Turner's roots were in Floyd, where he owned three sawmills by the age of 20. He raced at local dirt tracks from Galax to Roanoke and also ran a little moonshot on the side, never once getting caught. On the track, he won more than 350 races in all types of divisions, including 17 in what is now the Sprint Cup Series. His flamboyant, colorful personality earned him the nickname the Babe Ruth of stock car racing, and he was named one of NASCAR's 50 greatest drivers in 1998. He made a fortune in the timber business. In 1959, Turner helped design and build the Charlotte Motor Speedway along with partner Bruton Smith. It opened for business in 1960 and the roar of engines has been there ever since. Lining the walls of the track's present day media center are pictures of Curtis and Bruton and they'll be inducted together into the NASCAR Hall of Fame. Ironically, both men had contentious relationships with the sanctioning body. Turner was banned for life from NASCAR in 1961 by Big Bill France for trying to start a driver's union. But four years later, he was allowed back in because the sport needed a drawing card. Smith once tried to start a rival series to NASCAR, and he eventually founded Speedway Motorsports Incorporated, competing with NASCAR for dates and races. Today, SMI includes eight tracks, Bristol and Charlotte among them, that hold 12 Sprint Cup events a year. Curtis Turner raced well into the late 1960s. He died in October of 1970 when the private plane he was piloting crashed near Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania en route to Roanoke. His only passenger, Clarence King, the golf pro at Roanoke's Blue Hills Golf Club since 1957, died in the crash as well. Curtis Turner was born and raised in Floyd County, but Roanoke was his home for many years before the family moved to Charlotte. Two of Turner's children now live in the Roanoke Valley and recently told Joe DeShield that the recognition he's received has been a long time coming. And it's going to feel like he's home. <laughs> Margaret Sue Turner Wright says it's been a long journey. She's been working for more than 15 years to keep her father's name in the public eye. With the Curtis Turner Museum website, Facebook posts, and a display of cars and memorabilia at the Virginia Museum of Transportation. She says her father's induction into the NASCAR Hall of Fame will bring a sense of accomplishment. As soon as I walk off the stage and leave the area and it's done, I'm going to go, ah, did it, done it, yes. Many of Wright's earliest memories revolve around racing and time spent with her family on the way to the track. And then we would get there and it would be nighttime, it would be all the lights and everything and the loud sounds and the smell of the gas and the oil and I just loved it. Today, Wright is an artist. A portrait of her father hangs on the wall of her Roanoke studio. And a replica of the number 41 sits on a shelf near her easel. She says she was six or seven when she watched him race on the beach at Daytona. But Turner drives with his foot down all the way. They said, okay, your daddy's coming down a track. And I said, okay. And as soon as I look up, they went, Whoosh. he was like that. And my eyes were too little to keep up with it. So I never got to see him, but they said he went that way, you know. <laughs> That's the most proud that I am, knowing that he was there in the beginning. He helped build what has obviously turned into something different, but he was there on the ground level. Priscilla Galden was just 11 when her father died, but like her sister, she remembers going to the track as a child. She remembers her father's skill as a driver and his determination to win. If he wanted something, he went for it. Um, on the track, if he wanted your position, he went for it. My memory was he would pretty much move you out of the way if he wanted that spot. Turner's daughters are proud not only of his career as a driver, but as a doer who built the Charlotte Motor Speedway. Both say they love the stories they continue to hear from Curtis Turner's friends and fans. Some might be hard to believe, but almost all of them, they say, are true. I'm proud of my dad. I'm really excited that he's recognized for his contribution, and his contribution was colorful, but that was the man. He was colorful. There was no play acting with him. What you saw was really what you got. 
What would be his reaction to receive this, this award? He'd just smile with his little half smile and thank you very much. He'd just play it down, you know? Right. He'd be happy about it. He'd right. just say, okay, another party's starting pretty soon. Yeah. <laughs> he's kind of nonchalant, but in yeah. his heart of hearts, he'd be proud. Huh? Yes, he would. Yes, he would. Curtis was one in a long list of successful drivers who got behind the wheel for Stewart's Wood Brothers. We'll sit down with Lynn, Eddie, Glenn, and Leonard when we come back. My dad started racing because of Curtis. He used to go to Daytona Beach and watch him on the sand long before he started racing, just because he was a fan of Curtis Turner. And then, you know, the way the friendship worked out, you know, he wound up and, and drove our car and, and won some races in it. And it just, uh, you know, he owned the sand at Daytona Beach. And that was just really special. Welcome back everybody to Curtis Turner, hard charging legend. Curtis was a racing hero of Leonard and Glenn Wood and even contributed to their long-standing association with Ford Motor Company. Recently, we had a chance to sit down with the Wood brothers to get their memories of Curtis from the first time they saw him race in Mount Airy, North Carolina. It was a pleasure to just watch him come through them turns, throw that dirt. He was one of the best I ever saw anywhere on dirt. Curtis Turner had more control of a race car than any driver I've ever known. Glenn Wood had countless battles with Turner on the track from the early days on dirt at places like Roanoke Starkey Speedway to the pavement at Winston-Salem's Bowman Gray Stadium. I was passing him at Bowman Gray Stadium one time and I just got under him and uh, I, I, as I sort of looked over at him as I went by and the expression on his face told you how hard he was trying not to let me get by. I mean, it, it just like gritting his teeth, but I got him anyway. <laughs> he didn't mind sort of tapping you a little bit, <laughs> if, but he didn't wreck you. He would just do you enough to upset you. Turner, who drove the Wood Brothers car several times in the 50s and then again in 1965 following his four-year ban, earned the nickname Pop because he had a penchant for using his car's bumper to pop the cars of his rivals. The adage, never complain, never explain, certainly applied to Pop when he got behind the wheel. He simply wanted to drive and drive fast. He was out at Riverside one time and, and we had... Uh, uh, I told him I wanted to get in the car and see if the seat fit because he hadn't been in the car since they would prepared it for the road course. He stuck one foot in the door. He says, she's just right. <laughs> so, I, I mean, he, he was easy to please. I mean, uh, and of course, I think he could uh, drive a car sitting on a five gallon can if he had to. I mean, one time at uh, Daytona Beach, he was running his uh, teammate, uh, Joe Weatherly in a convertible race and of course Joe's windshield blew out. Now you know if it's a convertible and the windshield's gone you got a real streamlined car. So uh, it really helped Joe. And so he tried to kick his out <laughs> and took cramp in his leg while he was trying to kick it out but he still went, ended up winning the race. The first ever cup race at Rockingham found Curtis in the Woods Ford Galaxy with sponsorship from Harvest Ford in Salem, Virginia. Turner won the race, his last career victory, despite breaking a rib in the previous race in Charlotte. I end up uh, making a little old pad well and uh, uh, some bars off of the roll bar with a pad on it that rested against his shoulder. And then, of course, he's... Uh, got a big lead at the end of the race and it began getting hot and then he had to uh, uh, kind of baby it a little bit to keep it cool enough and uh, the reason that that happened was that new track it was sandy down there and the sand wore the fan belt down smaller and it started slipping. The Wood Brothers also witnessed Curtis taking part in his other passion, flying. He once landed his plane on a busy street in Easley, South Carolina, and another on the front stretch at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. I flew with him quite a bit, though, but uh, one of the times I was with him, he was about half drunk. <laughs> and we going on down, and he was telling me where some of the places were along the way, and I'm thinking, now, how is he going to put this thing down when we get to Charlotte? He set that thing down as, as if he had never had a drink, 
just as smooth as it could be. When we got in the car and he talked me into going home with him, somehow we got the law after us. <laughs> I ain't never took such a ride in my life. <laughs> Lynn and Eddie Wood currently run the race team. They were just youngsters when Curtis Turner was around, but while today's drivers are stars, Curtis was a hero who truly was larger than life. I was uh, cleaning cabinets out at the old shop on the creek and uh, run up on his uniform up on the top shelf. And I let, like, let it drop down. I was standing on the countertop. And I, I'm thinking like this guy was like eight feet tall. Whose was this? And it was Curtis Turner's. And so, I folded it back up and uh, I think Daddy eventually gave it to Margaret Sue, his daughter. He came to our house and I think it was probably 65, I'm going to guess, and um, I just remember how tall he was. And I heard, you know, I heard about him all my life and I, I mean I knew, I listened to races and, uh, and stuff when I was, was young like that, but I remember how big he was, uh, just how tall a man he was. and he. he his stature lived up to the, to the legend. With tonight's induction, the Hall of Fame grows to 35 members. Of those 35, 12 have been associated with the Wood Brothers in some shape, form, or fashion. Placards for each one of the 12 adorn the wall in the Wood Brothers Stewart shop. And yes, Curtis Turner's already hangs in the corner. Some of the folks that knew Curtis best still reside in Floyd County. Zach Glover visits with a pair of brothers, Barry and Bruce Sweeney, who grew up with Curtis as a family friend. This is where it all began for Curtis Turner at this small home in Floyd, Virginia. As he grew up behind the wheel, Curtis would spend time with local engine builder and family friend, Major Lee Sweeney. Sweeney's sons, Barry and Bruce, still to this day reside in Floyd, and they say they remember those days well. Yeah, he used to hang around my dad's garage. Of course, a lot of boys did and just hung around there and raced the old 40 forwards and all up and down the roads and dad would work on them. He built a lot of the engines for the bootleggers and all around and some of the earlier flathead forwards he built the engines for the racers at that time. He'd done uh, Curtis's dad and Curtis's work and all. They just hung under his heel for years growing up, but he'd come in Maybe once or twice a year, he had a Cadillac convertible, and he'd get a whole load of them, in which it was a gravel road. It was real crooked going back towards his house, and he'd take all the boys a little ride, so they'd have a little something to talk about for about a year. And when it came to Curtis Turner, there was always plenty to talk about, from spending lots of money and partying till dawn to high-speed chases while running moonshine. I mean, I've heard them stories back when I was real small, or what he could do with that car and a load of liquor on it. The Lord would be chasing him, and he could turn that thing right around in the middle of the road and head back the other way, and he'd be gone from the police. That was, his, that was the reason he was so good on outrunning them. But the police wasn't all that Curtis Turner could outrun. According to the Sweeney brothers, he was one of the hardest drivers to catch out on the racetrack. He was the best. That it, that I'd ever seen, and same about Bill France Sr. said he was the best driver he'd ever seen. If they'd come in and could outrun Curtis Turner, that made their day. That was their better than a prize. In Starkey, in uh, the convertible race was on the dirt track, and if I'm not mistaken, in about 75 laps, he had already left the field two times. You know, we had to, always a front-running car, but he'd come qualify in the back of the field just to get show off coming up through the pack. And, uh, of course, you know, Curtis raced a whole lot up in Pennsylvania and everywhere, which it wasn't NASCAR sanctioned, and won a lot of races. People didn't realize how many had won. He'd put on the show, let's just put it like that. And the results of that show will now be forever enshrined at the NASCAR Hall of Fame. When it first started up, he was really the pioneer of racing. I mean, that's, he was racing back when it started in the 50s. It's come a little late, I think, but I'm glad he got to go in there. He deserved it. NASCAR archivist and Lynchburg native Ken Martin has a unique perspective on Curtis Turner's life. We'll hear his story after the break. I think that was daddy's uh, hero when he was Start, before he ever started racing, like in 1947, Daddy 
we go to Daytona to watch him run on the beach. And, uh, and we've got like lots of pictures and he shows up sometimes like in, in a sport coat and gets in a race car. You know, and then there'll be other times he's standing there with a driver uniform on with a sport coat. Uh, it was a different time frame. NASCAR archivist and Lynchburg native Ken Martin has been a race fan since he was a youngster. In his office next door here in the NASCAR tower, he has access to more than 200,000 hours of NASCAR racing video and plenty of Curtis Turner. That is the coolest guy I've ever seen in my life. We have every race that has been broadcast on TV, but we know that Curtis's era came long before TV ever started. So one of the ways that we fill in that back part of the archive is with people's home movies or with little documentary films that were made. Fortunately, Curtis was such a charismatic, dynamic character that whenever there was a film crew around, they wanted to get some shots of Curtis. Curtis became popular with megastars of his era, including James Garner and even Elvis. He was the first NASCAR driver to appear on the cover of Sports Illustrated in 1968, a magazine that Martin still has. You know, I read a great quote from James uh, Garner. He said that Curtis knew he was a legend and he lived like a legend. Curtis lived life like on the tightrope. He, he lived it, you know, uh, recklessly at times, but he lived life to its fullest. You know, when I think about Curtis, I think of outstanding driving talent, but he was really one of our first drivers to transcend the sport. Growing up in Central Virginia as a young boy, uh, I got to see Curtis race at Starkey Speedway, at the Lynchburg Speedway, and, uh, and Curtis always attracted a crowd. When you knew Curtis was going to be on the track, you knew that you were going to get a show. Ken often traveled to the track with his dad who worked in racing, and a trip to Daytona in 1958 was especially memorable. Curtis won the race, and Ken still has the race program. In 1958, we made the trip down to Daytona, and uh, uh, it was going to be the very last race on the beach down there. And so as a young boy, I always collected programs and pictures, and here, you know, 50, 60 years later, I still have it, and I can go back into it and reference who were, who were the drivers in the field, what were their car numbers, and uh, who were the dignitaries that were there, and we use that when we're making some of our biographies and, and, and short films. We use that information for, to give us depth, uh, depth of knowledge. We still need to hear from the king, Richard Petty, who banged fenders with Curtis Turner on more than one occasion. Come on back, folks. Richard Petty was a member of NASCAR's first Hall of Fame class, thanks in no small part to his 200 wins and seven Cup Series championships. But before all that success, he traded paint with a cagey veteran named Curtis Turner. Here's Karen Loftus. Curtis was a flamboyant uh, show off, okay? You know what I mean? The King, telling it like it was. Richard Petty overlapped with Curtis Turner for a few years on the track and got to see firsthand how the 2016 NASCAR Hall of Fame inductee handled his business in the racing world back in the 60s. Most of the tracks were dirt at that time, and he'd run sideways down the straightaway, and, and the crowds loved it, okay? And uh, whether he won or lost, he put on a show. Richard and Curtis had many a battle behind the wheel, as did Turner and the King's father, Lee Petty. The competition on the track kept the racing tight and the excitement high for anyone that was bold enough to challenge Turner, who was a natural talent on the track and just enjoyed being out there. He was just a party man. He he just drove on Sunday just because he loved to drive. Money was no object. I mean, he didn't drive the race car for money because it wasn't in him. But he done it just for the pure uh, joy of just driving a race car. And so he could express himself. Maybe during the week he had to work and do whatever he had to do, but on uh, Saturday and Sunday he could uh, he could enjoy himself, he could go run a race, and then he could go get drunk, so he was big time. We're not quite done with our half hour special. We'll put the wraps on Curtis Turner, hard charging legend, when we come back. Thanks for joining us tonight, everybody, for our half hour special, Curtis Turner, hard charging legend. Have a great safe weekend, folks, and we'll see you in Daytona in just a few weeks.